This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Intent to Deceive, Denying the Genocide of the Tutsi by Linda Malvern. It is 25 years since the 1994 genocide of the Tutsi of Rwanda, when in the course of three terrible months, more than one million people were murdered. In the intervening years, a pernicious campaign has been waged by the perpetrators to deny this crime, with attempts to falsify history and blame the victims for their fate. Intent to Deceive tells the story of this campaign of genocide denial from its origins with those who planned the massacres. With unprecedented access to government archives, including in Rwanda, Linda Malvern explains how, from the moment the killers seized the power of the state, they determined to distort the reality of events. Disinformation was an integral part of their genocidal conspiracy. These masters of deceit have found new and receptive audiences, and have fooled gullible journalists and unwary academics. The book is a testament to the survivors who still live the horrors of the past. This is a call for justice that remains perpetually delayed. Intent to Deceive, Denying the Genocide of the Tutsi, by Linda Malvern, out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. And one day, I do look forward to getting out and seeing all of those of you who live elsewhere once again. The question I've been relentlessly asking myself is how the left can concretely strategize and then effectively organize to confront this moment. I imagine you've been asking much of the same. It's beyond obvious that these are crisis conditions that could deepen a pre-existing legitimacy crisis, a crisis that was already monstrously manifest with Trump's 2016 election, a crisis that in turn finds its roots in various prior moments, the destruction of the New Deal order and organized labor's power beginning in the 1970s, the rise of mass incarceration, immigrant criminalization, and border militarization, the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of a unipolar, hyper-globalizing world in the 1990s, September 11th and the interminable war on terror that followed and that has since then seen a slide toward a nonpolar world order, and, of course, the 2008 financial crisis, Obama's election, Obama's handling of it all, the Tea Party, and then the cycle of left social struggles and socialist politics that emerged in response. A crisis creates opportunities, as I have said again and again in recent weeks, but those opportunities are by no means exclusively tailored to the left's purposes. Sometimes, as we now well know, quite to the contrary. We can only speculate as to what shape things might take, and there are some bleak speculations that might seem plausible, a matrix-like reality for the middle and professional classes sustained in their socially isolated work-live play tubes by an Amazon that has amassed war state monopoly powers exploiting a working class consigned to the outside world exposed to viral lethality. But in truth, what sort of objective conditions will shape our actions moving forward, even mere weeks from now, it's all radically uncertain. We can still make sense of the present conjuncture, though only in partial glimpses because it is moving so fast, and we are taking it all in through multiple layers of mediation. Organizers have identified contradictions, cracks, and openings— Homeless people seizing empty homes to simultaneously obtain and demand housing. Politicizing the mass inability to pay rent 
into a rent strike, a conscious act of mass refusal with a demand, exploiting the now obvious gap between how essential workers' labor is for our survival and how, by contrast, those workers are treated and paid as though they are disposable. In other words, what you are doing is challenging the balance of class forces that dictates the course of this crisis. The stimulus package was a moment that was too fast and too elite managed to be as contingent and open to contestation as we might have hoped, but new rescue packages will certainly be necessary for the system's stabilization and preservation, and that debate and fight is just getting started, and it's what we must confront head on. One thing that I'm working on that I wanted to let you know about is a project to try to convince everyone, all of you and everyone else, to make protest banners and hang them from your windows. I'm doing that with an amazing group of people, artist Molly Crabapple, filmmaker Yael Bridge, musician Jeffrey Brodsky, social media master Rachel Millman, and anthropologist and grad student organizer Danielle Carr. And what we're going to do is release a snappy video explaining how to make DIY protest banners at home and then how to hang them from your house. If you'd like to get a head start and make and hang your own banner at your home now, please, please do so, and we'll make sure to share it on the internet so that other people are inspired to do just the same. But... That video should be out soon, I think within a week. Anyhow, my guests today are organizer Jason Perez and journalist Sarah Jaffe, who have a lot of thoughts on all of this. But before we get started, we do depend on your support to make this all possible. And the place that listeners support us is at patreon.com slash the dig. If you do have steady income right now and you can afford to, please contribute what you can. We also, as you likely know, have a left-wing book or books to send you in the mail if you contribute at least $10 a month. But why I'd really love you to donate is because your support is what makes this possible, including a lot of new work that we're doing. One thing is helping listeners start virtual dig book clubs and we already have i think more than 15 people signed up to host book clubs which is amazing just since we announced this on friday if you want to host a monthly book club or join a monthly book club email julia.rose.rock at gmail.com the first ever book club book will be kim phillips finds Fear City, which I'm interviewing her about soon, and then you all can have book club discussions as you see fit. We'll help provide some discussion questions that you may use if you like, and then there will be a big Zoom call with me and Kim Phillips-Fine where you can ask questions, make comments, etc. So if you do want to host or join a DIG book club, email julia.rose.com rock at gmail.com. Point being, we are spending time and money to make that happen, and we are also spending time and money on a new, special, short-run narrative audio series on life and politics in the COVID era. You can send your pitch to the dig.covid at gmail.com, and you can find out more about what we're looking for at the dig radio. Dot com, where we have a call for pitches posted. Radio experience is encouraged, but not required. Anyhow, I've sort of lost my thread here, and that thread was to tell you that we depend on you, our listeners, to support us. And so if you haven't done so already, please do contribute what you can at patreon.com slash the dig. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Okay, here's Jason Perez and Sarah Jaffe. Jason Perez is a senior research analyst at ACRE, or the Action Center on Race and the Economy, who studies the connections between police violence, mass incarceration, and economic injustice. 
Before becoming a researcher, Jason was a lead organizer for SEIU Local 73 and BYP 100. When Jason isn't selling his labor for subsistence, you can find him rapping with the rap group BBU and organizing with DSA's Afro-Socialists and Socialists of Color Caucus. Sarah Jaffe, a frequent guest here on this show, is a reporting fellow at the Type Media Center, the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and the forthcoming book, Work Won't Love You Back, both from Bold Type Books. You can find Sarah on Twitter at Sarah L. Jaffe and on the internet at sarahljaffe.com. Sarah Jaffe and Jason Perez, welcome to The Dig. Thank you for having me. And Sarah, welcome back. Hello. Am I am I ahead of Aziz Rana yet? <laughs> I'll have to count. You, it's a close. You, you, Aziz, and Naomi, it's close. It's close. There is a ton to talk about in terms of concrete organizing work and strategies and tactics, but I want to start just by talking about the bigger picture, which is a really deeply confusing one. Obviously, we have the coronavirus crisis, which began to fully descend upon us right as the presidential race shifted from Bernie to Biden around Super Tuesday. And of course, beyond that, we're four years into Trump, four years into DSA's explosive growth, maybe about two years or so into Sunrise's emergence, all in the wake of this major cycle of social struggles comprising Occupy, the Obama-era anti-deportation campaign, Black Lives Matter, and Standing Rock. So to start off, big picture, what is the state of the U.S. left right now, and how does it fit <laughs> into the bigger political situation? Because no pressure. It's been quite a roller coaster, and I think everyone's very confused. <laughs> no pressure at all. Jason, I'm throwing this one to you first. Wow, that's hilarious. Um so I'm um, putting on my Adolf Reed hat. The state of the left is weak to very weak. No, I'm joking. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and perpetually weak unless it does these three things that I say that I've been saying for 15 years. Okay, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Thanks. <laughs> right? That's how I sound to my daughter. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the rise of DSA is super important, right? I think um, just as important is, you know, the elections of um, of socialist can of, of socialist elected officials. Um, I think you know when you see things like sunrise, um, so like you know what's thought of as kind of more momentum or movement based organizing. Um, I think those things are, are are promising and speaks to especially like when you look at something like sunrise in terms of like how we train up folks um, around doing disruption and civil disobedience at a mass level, um, while also like fighting for concrete policy changes um, or structural changes like the Green New Deal. I think those fronts are are amazing. Um, I think also the level of skills that people who identify, self-identify as, as leftists, not just progressives or, or socialists, um, have in terms of winning elections or losing elections, but then learning the lessons from them. Um, so all of those things are, are really, 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 really good. Um, I think, though, at the level of labor, even though we see, I think, a lot of visible campaigns, even in, in red states and a lot of visible striking, I still f- believe, you know, the state of labor and labor organizing is is relatively weak to the um, amount of organizing we need in order to get the kind of change that we want at this point. Sarah? Yeah, I would say I would agree with all of that. I would just add that like, so I am, because we're talking about stimulus bills, we're talking about demands to be made on the state in this crisis, because that's what we need in a moment of massive economic disruption to say nothing of the healthcare crisis that this actually is, is state action, looking at where we were in 2008 versus now, the world is totally different. And that's amazing. Like we we are still too weak now, particularly, as Jason said, on the labor movement front, but we were dead in 2008. And that was, you know, right. that was what had sort of felt like at least a step towards something more progressive in having elected Barack Obama. And like (laughs) there were conversations, you know, around the Green New Deal in 2008. I'm so old. I remember that. 
but there was nothing on the ground remotely like what we're seeing already now. And there were no sort of networks connecting different movements and different organizations and different groups the way that there have been now since then. And so while it's still, you know, we need more of everything right now, yesterday, three weeks ago, I also think that it's really important to look at the way that the organizing that's happening now, the mutual aid that's happening now, is happening along the lines of networks that have been built over the last decade plus of movement organizing and movement growth. In terms of of mutual aid, that is those are two words that we've seen mentioned, discussed a lot on the left in the last few weeks. And obviously it's on a fundamental level important to help people survive because that is in accordance with our ethical principles as leftists and socialists. But what is the difference between mutual aid and charity? Because if we don't embed these actions into some kind of organizing framework that's just that's just what it is right yeah i mean i i would i mean i i think there's a history of of mutual aid being like that leads to the you know stronger more sustained direct action and social movement building so you know think of the panthers and the free breakfast program and then how it eventually led to just the basic assumption that we have now where public schools have free breakfast and free lunch and before then that wasn't necessarily the norm in most places so i think there's always the potential it can lead to that you know but you have to have like a political program and an organizing program for that and then i also just would connect it to you know how you move from the line of making sure that it's not just charity but actually like radical um, or militant mutual aid is looking at the examples of act up so like a lot of the work that preceded ACT UP and what led to ACT UP in terms of, you know, its, its anti-AIDS um, a- a- activism came from mutual aid networks of literally having to care for dying people. And so I think when we pull from those examples and those traditions, then I think we can move to a place where it's not just not, 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 not just charity, but I think, you know, we always have to be explicit that we have to be organizing for a challenge, a challenge of state power um, and corporations, and not just assume that mutual aid in and of itself then allows us to create like a parallel space that doesn't need to be involved with state power and, and corporations. Yeah, I think one of the things I keep referring back to is that like the the Black Panthers programs were survival pending revolution, right? Like that was very very clear that that was what it was, um, and in in thinking about. Charity. I spent a lot of time thinking about this around and sort of after Occupy Sandy in New York, because like, you know, some Occupy Sandy organizers would say to me like, you know, yeah, we ended up doing a a shitload of charity and that's fine. Hmm. Like people were dying. Yeah, Yeah. And you could not sort of show up on their doorstep and say, we'll give you this, but only if you come to an organizing meeting. <laughs> like that's never, that's never an acceptable way yeah, to do it. That's uh, shit. Right. <laughs> right? And that's certainly not now. But one of the things that you do in those moments is you build trust and you build, again, networks that you can then activate. So if you are going to your neighbor's door right now, like I live in Philadelphia, if I'm going to my neighbor's door and saying, hey, can, I'm going to the grocery store. Can I pick stuff up for you? Um, can I walk your dog so that you don't have to go outside? Like whatever it is, you're building trust with that person for later, bigger steps. And so that's, that's important. I think one of the differences, and I'm thinking about this because, um, the book that I just turned in a first draft of has a chapter on sort of nonprofit organizations and labor in nonprofit organizations. And so one of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of charity, um, that I spent a lot of time fiddling with for that is the the hierarchical structure of charity is like we have power and we are going to dole out a little bit of things to you. So the powerful are giving you some stuff. Whereas mutual aid is, you know, it got the, the word gets sort of a bad rap after Occupy, but it's horizontally organized. You are not saying like we have power and we're going to like hand you a few snippets. You're saying like what can we do for each other? What can we do in this neighborhood together to take care of each other? And you might have skills and knowledge that the other person doesn't have, right? Like the um, New York State Nurses Association did a ton of volunteer work um, during Sandy and the nurses obviously have medical knowledge that like your average person doesn't. 
but they're not coming to your door in the way that like the church or like the um, Samaritan's Purse people who are setting up a tent in Central Park, right? And it sounds like what you're also saying is it's not so like philanth- philanthropically dependent. It's it's the entire structures of sort of charitable organizations or nonprofit organizations or 501c3s are set up in hierarchical structures with the funders at the top and then managers in between and then the people who do the work doing the work, right? And so there are like levels in those structures that I think is important to think about when we're thinking about like what makes something charity. What are these relationships that actually exist in the structures of our economy and in the structures of our interactions? One thing that seems like it's in play is how how mutual aid can expose the state as monstrously absent in the ways that we need it when we most need it. But I think what's critical is that the point isn't, at least from a socialist perspective, is not to convey that that we, civil society or whatever, should be the ones providing these social services instead of the state, but rather that the state should be doing these things. How how do we make mutual aid not this sort of libertarian model? <laughs> yeah, because like the there's a lot of, you know, Michael Bloomberg's New York City, which is, was during Occupy Sandy, like Michael Bloomberg was perfectly happy for, you know, Occupy Sandy to be doing the relief work and then he didn't have to do it and he could go celebrate the reopening of the stock exchange, right? Um, There's definitely a way that like, I was talking to somebody this morning about like what this would be like under the George W. Bush administration and it would just be like tons of handouts to really right-wing religious groups to do charity, right? That's- Faith-based. They're real happy for people to step into those cracks and do that work. But the question of the state is is really interesting because I I spent this morning thinking about and reading this wonderful, horrifying article at The Intercept about the police arresting people and throwing them in jail for not social distancing. So like the state can be monstrously absent. It can also be monstrously present at the same time. And what people's interaction with the state has always been is going to shape I mean, everything about your politics, everything about how you think of the world, right? I think just to add to the the building trust piece, though, is um, I think too, I think the benefit of mutual aid versus like you know versus charity is is that you know when you're doing a mutual aid project and process, I think it helps build up like an organization or formation discipline that then can lead to then like the ability to do a direct action, the ability to confront those who is causing you to have to do mutual aid in the, in the first place and take those resources or democratize those resources that you need. So I think that's, you know, there's always this relationship with like, it's almost that like, I, it's hard to know if you can, if you can't build an effective mutual aid infrastructure, especially in a time to, in, of crisis, it's that much more or less likely, in my opinion, that then you can build out a strong network in order to organize a rent strike, organize a tenant union, organize various direct actions that you're going to need to do to go after the sources of power that are, you know, causing our oppression at the time. Yeah. And then just the, um, I still feel, feel like the connection between it not going to falling into a charity framework is about, I mean, some of what Sarah's point was a survival a pending revolution. It's it's on the strength of like our own organizational political programs to make sure that messaging is getting out and that it's within a context, not like we'll give you this mutual aid and then you better come to this meeting. <laughs> but um, but within the context of us like, you know, that, that this is also ideological work that we're doing in relationship to like, you know, trying to win a different world so that we don't have to ever do this again. Yeah. Yeah. And we should just be clear that like socialism isn't just about having a bigger state, right? We, the the state is getting bigger right now in a lot of places. Um, James Butler at Novara Media did sort of a rundown of all these emergency powers these European governments are giving themselves, Viktor Orban and Hungary being the worst, but like a lot of them are, are taking emergency powers. And that makes the state bigger, right? Like hiring more cops makes the state bigger. These are not things that we as socialists want. So the question is is more complicated than like, should the state be doing this? What should the state be doing and how? And how do we want it delivered? Like the wages for housework movement, um, they were very clear about things like um, child care. They were like, we want to organize the child care in our neighborhood and then we want the state to pay for it. 
not like we want the state to just decide how child care is going to be done, but we want our child care designed the way we want it, and then we want it to be funded by the government. Yeah, that's an important point. So so, so mutual aid can be a microcosm of of sorts, but not in a purely anti-statist way, right, but in a complexly yeah. state-critical it, it, way. It can lead to, like, I think the idea of, like, democratizing the state. So, I mean, at least for me, the distinction I always put is, like, there's state and then there's government. State is the thing that has a monopoly on power and force. And then government is the thing that, like, we actually democratically control and there is no monopoly on force, just, you know, quote unquote, democratic consent. And that, you know, like our, our goal is to democratize the state until it's it's it, it represents, you know, a go, you know, a government of working class people. But then and then our mutual aid. You know, I guess I I has I I don't want to romanticize mutual aid too much. You know, like I mean, I think that it's, it's super important. It's it's fundamental, but it's always it's you know it's it's partially a stopgap until we, you know, create the you know the political structure and economic structure that we want, which is one that's democratically owned and controlled. You know, by by the working class. Well, more concretely, what what are you all hearing in terms of successful or interesting mutual aid? organizing efforts around the country or world. I think successful is such an interesting word to attach to that. Um, I'm being all English major here, I know, but like, (laughs) you know, like I, uh, successful, like, I mean, I think people are building networks in their communities. I know, again, I'm in the People's Republic of West Philly. Dan, I know you miss it here. People's Republic of Um, West Philly. Oh my God. (laughs) Every day. I, I, I love it. Um, and yeah, and, and there's a lot of lefties around here. There's a lot of organizing around here on a normal day. So there's a lot of movement along those networks where people are taking care of each other. And then just sort of basics, like our neighbors check in and are like, all right, I'm going to the store. Do you need anything? A lot more than normal. Um, and whatever normal even means anymore. So like thinking about that, like, I don't, I don't know how to say like what's successful because like there's no end point. You know, right. it's it's we're building things sort of slowly and and strongly. It's harder to say that like a mutual aid project has a success the same way as like the Instacart workers went on strike and now Instacart is going to give them safety kits. Like that's that's a success. I guess I mean moving moving beyond the Google Doc and actually delivering delivering. Yeah, the goods. I mean, I think <laughs> I think in Chicago, obviously, I'm biased. Um, I think you know has has had a good example of like mutual aid networks, like actually being able to help people out in terms of like just basics, like grocery shopping, um, rent relief, all this type, like you know th- those type that type of work. Um, but then also it attached to like you know like the socialist aldermen that that we have in Chicago, you know, like aldermen. And Rosanna Rodriguez like has been able to like really make sure um, like the power of her office is connected to making sure those efforts are are supported while not you know claiming the the credit of uh, like uh, like uh, of of that mutual aid work but then also pivoting to a thing of saying you know to the powers that be at least in the city of Chicago um, like the mayor's office and other aldermen who don't necessarily want to do their work that hey our government should be providing this and should be supporting this. And we need to like transition to that also. So I feel like that's like the, I mean, I think I I feel like some of the stuff that Chicago is doing is like a good example of like how to work, you know, like outside of the system, but then also within the system and still pressing these demands on, you know, on government to, to do better. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really obsessed with the, the reclaim our homes actions in Los Angeles, where you have homeless families who have been parts of, of housing organizing networks for a while now, moving into these vacant homes that are owned by the California Department of Transportation because they took them over through eminent or th- under sort of threat of eminent domain. They bought them cheap years ago when they were going to expand the highway out there. And so these homes are sitting vacant that are literally owned by the state. And so people were like, you know what? We can't be homeless in this crisis. We can't socially distance without somewhere to live. You can't, you know, stay at home without a home. So they moved into those. And that is an action that is mutual aid in terms of like, we are moving into a house with the support of neighbors, with the support of our organizing networks, but also making a very explicit demand on the state because the state literally owns the house and being like, are you going to and, and and almost like a dare to the state, right? Like, we dare you to kick us out right now. Which is great. Tactically you know? is like, that's genius. That's just like the best yeah. thing that you can. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. love we it. We need more of that, like, you know, nationwide. I want to talk a lot more about housing in a minute, but first, 
just some bigger picture questions in terms of how this kind of incohate left moment might coalesce in, in the weeks and months to come. In a recent essay at, at Waging Nonviolence, Paul Engler writes, quote, Right now, lots of people are formulating action plans and policy demands, focusing on how the government should respond or measures that elected officials might pass by way of emergency response. What's missing is a platform and vision for mass participation, a means through which people can join in and collectively take part in a movement to create the type of just response our society needs. What do you make of, of this part of Engler's argument, and what might a platform and vision for mass participation look like? How might it take shape? And where does that platform and vision fit into what we would hope might be a movement? Yeah, I mean, I know just in conversations with other organizers, I think that's we've been feeling that sentiment of like, these are great demands and obviously way better demands than what were coming up in 2008. But because of the context, unfortunately, of having to be sheltered in, we can't, you know, fight for those demands in the in the ways that we, we would like to. So there's like, yeah, way too many, not way too many demands, <laughs> but a lot of demands and like a lack of like strategy and tactics that we could use to put pressure on decision makers and, and fight the kind of fight that we want. I mean, with the exception, of course, of essential workers that are striking. Um, but I think even then, I think one would argue that, you know, we're not, we're getting really great wildcat strike waves, but we're not getting strike waves at the scale that we want. So, but that's also, we're also really soon in this and, and it's, it's hard to like figure out what to do or not to do. In terms of the mass participation part, I feel that 110%. And I do feel like it's interesting that the right wing has already found, I mean, it's, it's because they're also going after lower level targets, but the right wing has found a way to like go into like, you know, black and people of color, Zoom, Zoom like presentations and then say a bunch of racist shit, you know? So, but we need to, but us as the left, we need to figure out what's our thing in terms of electronic disruption and electronic disobedience towards the powers that be um, and towards decision makers that can actually, you know, interfere with like, the messaging that they're trying to say, like, especially like, let's say in New York, when, you know, like their top cop is saying that like, oh, we still need to arrest people to keep things safe or whatever. And that like, you know, we have to figure out ways to like disrupt those things electronically, but then also figure out ways where we're engaging our members that move past kind of like some of the traditional pitfalls of, you know, digital organizing of just like, you know, like you look at people's bailout thing and it's just like, you know, sign this thing, you know, sign that versus what Bernie was doing, which was like, you know, a million callers um, going to like elected officials during the stimulus fight. And honestly, it's really just, you know, Bernie's campaign apparatus that has that actually meets the threshold of mass, at least in my opinion, mass participation has been executing on that consistently right now. Sarah? Yeah, I think the the word platform in those sentences is really interesting to me because I'm both like thinking about like platforms in terms of like platform capitalism, right? Which is like Uber, right? Is platform capitalism. Um, and so I'm like, oh, so do we need like a website? Um, or platform, like a political platform, right? Like the thing that um, just before we got on the phone here that like the Sanders campaign put out like basically a platform for the next stimulus, which is great. It has like $2,000 a month basic income, which I'm obsessed with right now. I mean, I'm always, but like, especially right now. Anyway, we can talk about that later. But like, <laughs> so, great yeah, obsession, so I'm looking at so. both of those things and like, what is the platform? Both like, what are our political demands? Um, and there has been great sort of, you know, unifying sort of like no work, no rent, free them all, um, yeah, you know, yeah, like those yeah, kinds yeah, of yeah, things yeah. Um, that those are sort of basic, but like, um, and they are really good points from which you can pull a lot of demands, sort of like the Movement for Black Lives platform had these sort of overarching points and then beneath them a bunch of bulleted demands, which was really, really great. And sort of the only thing on that front that I've been really impressed with in the last like decade, basically. And then like a platform like an organizing technology, right? So this goes in in like two directions of two things we we need. Um, and the question of like electronic disobedience, right? Because as Jason was saying, it's a lot easier to do that when like you're just being a dick. <laughs> um, and but like, I mean, but to fascist. be serious, like there are people on the left who think that being a dick to near attendant on Twitter is activism. Oh wow! And I'm sorry, it's not. Wow, shots fired. Oof. 
Big topic I'm sorry. Time. Like, and I'm look. I'm not crying about Neera Tanden, and I'm never going to cry about Neera Tanden. Um, wow, you're defending Neera Tanden. She probably wow. deserves every mean tweet, but like, also, that's not yeah, yeah. Sending snake emojis to Elizabeth Warren supporters is not organizing. It's not a tactic. It's not going to work. It's not going to win you mass politics. It's just going to make people think you're a jerk. I have never um, sent a snake emoji. I have replied. A I few, know. I'm not I have replied. No, I'm saying I have replied to Neera Tandon a few times. Look, I've quote tweeted times. like but whatever. But Neera Tandon, like she um, so just, she wants that. Like she like yeah, welcomes that. I know. Like, she, I know. Well, that's the thing, right? She Is thrives it, like, off of it. We end up sort of, yeah. right. We end up sort of proving their point. Yeah. By yeah. doing the thing that they're already saying we're doing. And like, it's super exaggerated. And it's super ridiculous. And it's like a dumb thing to fight about. But like, the right can do that because basically like all they want to do is drive marginalized people off the internet. We're not going to drive Neera Tannen off the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even if we did, she still has structural power. She's still in charge of cap. And you're not yeah. disrupting that by tweeting mean things at her. So so then what do we we do? We may need a uh we may need a website or websites, uh, but obviously that's <laughs> woefully in- Is this the updated Lenin? What is to be done? Have a socialist newspaper. What is to be done? Have a website. Podcasts. I mean, uh, I, I mean I think there's still like I mean there's there's still protests that we can do in person where we social distance, right? So I think and I think it's just we're just all trying to figure out how to get to that. Um I think the car caravans that a lot of the decarceration and anti-ice work has been doing is like a really good example. Um, I think we're going to be seeing like an escalation of like going to decision makers houses like you saw in LA with Garcetti. Um, right. With homes and, activists. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and shutting stuff down in, in that kind of way. Um, and then I think the regular support of like essential workers in terms of like the protests that they're doing, I, I, I don't think that, we're going to completely move away from, I, you know, I, I think there's a reason why you're starting to see this, um, this response of like emergency powers from the state that wants to like ban mass gatherings and that want like this more carceral form of enforcement. It's not just to like, quote unquote, for to maintain the pandemic, because like, you know, a lot of these states that, that want to do that, they didn't even want to shut stuff down the right way. It's to be able to contain people from organizing and figuring out creative ways to organize in person and to do mass protests and mass civil disobedience um, and to be able to, like, you know, shut it down in, in, in a real way. And, and we're still going to have to, you know, we're, we're still going to have to put up pressure on the powers that be, like, let's say, you know, Lori Lightfoot here in Chicago, where, you know, we're going to have to dare her to, arrest people in mass that are around her house and put them in jail during an epidemic or do the right thing and like, you know, provide, you know, rental assistance for all, stop, you know, mortgages, stop rent, rental payments, you know, all the things that the whole laundry list of things that we want. And and we're still going to have to like do that type of work in person and, and dramatize those moments in person so that it forces you know, the political question for people. Yeah. Mike Davis was emphatic about this when I spoke to him recently that we can't see the streets, you know, with an asterisk. Sometimes we need to like, but, you know, the good news is that the bar for good turnout at a protest is is low. <laughs> is low. Right. Um, well, right. <laughs> put people first. Pens- but also like social distancing. So I was just thinking of when I was in L.A. for the teacher's strike last year, one of the most amazing actions was actually a line just along this one street that had three schools on it, like within a mile. And so the parents and the students from these schools organized this themselves, the solidarity line where they just stood along the street, single file between these three schools. And imagine that, but six feet apart. Right. Or there was another day in L.A. where they just had people on like every corner and I was driving from one school to the other. And so every corner you would just come to like another bunch of people. So imagine I think Mike Davis said this to you, Dan, right, that like there's one person on every corner with a sign. Yeah. But it's the same sign. Right. Right. So you have that organized like every block in West Philly. Right. If you're on, on Baltimore Avenue, because I know Dan and I know this anyway. I don't know how much time you spent in West Philly, Jason. I've, but This is over. You should come I've visit. never. The closest I came to West Philly is reading Oppose, Propose. And like the history of like the co-op movement, I guess inside of yeah. Philly. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's yeah. A, there's a, there's a huge right. cooperative house movement that still has houses that are you know heirs to that that movement. Yeah. And, 
Mary Post Food Co-op still. Yeah, there's a there was a book there there was a little booklet or maybe a long article written in like the Journal of Anarchist Studies. I think it's called like a decade ago about <laughs> that. Great. FYI for listeners who want to go nice. into West Philly history. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> but think about this too. Like school. what? <laughs> What institutions are we going to build in this moment out of the mutual aid that could still that will be around? Yeah. Right? Like, what does that yeah. look like? In Philly, it was but movement yeah, like, for I a new think, society. FYI, yeah, that's the name of the yeah, group. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Go ahead. But yeah, so there is there is there is two things that we have a lot of power to do right now. One is not do things. Right? Like going into work. Call in sick, y'all. Tell your boss you've got coronavirus. We don't have enough <laughs> tests. They can't prove you don't. Um, the, I am not kidding at all. We do not have testing yeah, ramped no. up anywhere near where we need to in this country. You cannot get a test. If you call and ask for one, they're going to tell you to just stay home. So stay home. I think one thing that I haven't been seeing in our demands is like, you know, universal testing and tracing. I just feel like we've all, yeah, I, I've... I mean, I'm even thinking about some of my own calls and I just I haven't brought up stuff like that. And yeah, it's hard, right? Because like one of the things that like the British government, say, is talking about is like once they get the sort of antibody testing up so that they can test to see if you've had the disease and have the antibodies in your system, that then they can issue sort of a passport that like lets you out. <laughs> Oh my god! And like you can envision oh that god. being so oh That's bad, so right? That's terrible. I, I did want to point out and shout out an action in Philly put on by Put People First PA, which was an actual in-person human protest with social di- distance demanding that H- Hahnemann Hospital, which was closed, I think last year it was, over major protests, be reopened. The the California business guy who owns the building, Joel Friedman, is demanding an exorbitant amount of money to let the city use the space. But according to the Inquirer report on it, quote, there were just 10 people there, all wearing masks and gloves and standing at least eight feet away from each other. Yeah. And so I went today to go. um, In fact, let's be real. I went to New Jersey to buy wine because the state liquor stores are closed in Pennsylvania That's right outrageous. now. Wait, um, and on my way back, because of the-, they, the the state of Pennsylvania owns the liquor stores, most of them. And so you can get wine from like a couple of grocery stores that have a special license, or you can go to New Jersey. Sorry, so that I is went to New Jersey with a great little because wine store. That liquor put stores it in the are an essential car. service. And I'm not even, I'm only like 5% joking about that. <laughs> no, no, not no, not, not at all. Wow. Um, a, my mental health and B, like people who are actually alcoholics who are physically dependent. Yeah, no, it's it's real. Um, so it's not that you can't, but like, anyway, whatever. So I went to New Jersey and then I came back and I was driving down the highway in the middle of the city where there are all these overpasses. And there were these wonderful banners that were hanging off those overpasses saying free Hanneman. And then one was like billionaires think something, what side are you on? And like banner drops are another wonderful social distance to action, right? Like you don't need, you need one person. And they make great social media. They are wonderful to share. I try to share everyone that I see on Instagram because, yeah, and they make people think, right? So, like, I already agree free Hanneman. But, like, what if somebody's driving along and they don't even know and they see that banner and then they Google it and they're like, oh, man, that is fucked up. Well, a little preview. Uh, Hopefully I will be announcing it in the introduction to this episode when I release it. I am working with Molly Crab Apple and a few other people to develop a hopefully very inspirational how to turn your house into a protest by making a banner and dropping it from your window video that will be out um, next week. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are things that are really, really easy to do in some ways. And like, right, you can do them in your neighborhood. You can also drop them off an overpass. Um, Beware of the cops, obviously, because the cops are not slowing down right now. But like, these are things that that are sort of time honored tactics that take on a new significance when people don't have that much human contact. The human contact that we do have is, is becoming like much more meaningful right now. And I think we need to like think really hard about that. You know, like the people that I interact with right now, it was really weird because I live with two women. And we had an electrical problem in our apartment. So um, some guys came over to fix it. And I was like, oh, my God, I haven't seen a man in three weeks. <laughs> it was really strange. But like, you know, so every every interaction that we're having right now with other humans like feels much more loaded. I was just talking to a pharmacist from from West Virginia who's saying that like, you know, they've got he's got clients who normally just come in and get their medicine and say, hey, and then leave who now like they want to stand and talk. Because it's like the only time they've been out of their house all week. And especially like elderly people, they're standing like six feet away, but they really want to talk. And so those those interactions are like suddenly have a lot more power. 
power than maybe, you know, when you were seeing 20 people in your average day. I mean, I think there is a role for like calling your mayor, calling your alder person, your council yes. person, calling your thing and doing it. And then also expropriating from labor unions. No, I'm joking. But like like working with labor unions, like for like their call in dialers so that like we can do it in mass and organizing our people for that. But then, and then I think another level too is that, you know, making sure and most most community organizations, most labor organizations know like who elected officials like funders are and um, and like doing actions on those people or, or people in private equity, things like that, that own hospitals, own the things, the goods and services that we need to get through this crisis and doing act, like, you know, doing call ins, doing mailers, doing things like that. And then and also escalating up to like in person actions. Um, and this is a time when we can do it. At, at mask and, and scale, unfortunately, right now, it don't, not unfortunately, fortunately, and thank goodness, like that he's still in the weight race, Bernie, um, seems to be the only one that's kind of trying to get everyone in that direction doing that right now. Jason, I know you, you read this uh, Twitter th- thread. I don't know if you've subjected uh, yourself to it, Sarah, but it's something I've been thinking a lot, unsurprisingly, is what the Bernie campaign should be up to. And I think that Bernie's doing a, a a great job leading at the top with his message, and it's great that he's using his list to raise money for good groups that urgently need it. And I haven't read this new this new proposal out for the next round of stimulus yet, but that and that sounds good. But but what I really want to see happen, and what's kind of like killing me right now, is that the campaign infrastructure is sort of lying there dormant, and I'm not. When it could, and I think should, be retooled and reactivated for for the moment, both to collect delegates for the DNC, of course, but also around these movement demands, hopefully behind that proposal for stimulus and for locally tailored state level demands. Because I'm part of Rhode Island's volunteer campaign leadership core, and it's all volunteer. Like we've had staff through to do you know, certain things around, you know, getting Bernie on the, the like ballot ballot access stuff for signatures and, and delegate selection and stuff like that. But it's been all volunteer leadership here. And we're we're sort of adrift at the moment. And I imagine the same is true for volunteer leaders, Bernie campaign leaders in other states nationwide. And if the national Bernie campaign took the lead in reactivating volunteer leadership at the state level, We, speaking for Rhode Island, and I presume this would be similar in other states, we in turn could organize our own volunteer bases, which which are pretty sizable. And that that could happen nationwide, including in states like California that have already voted. And that would be so cool because I don't know of any I doubt any presidential campaign has ever reactivated a campaign infrastructure in a state that's already voted. But that could be very powerful. I don't know. Am I crazy? What do you both think? So um, I don't know how much this has been talked about yet, um, but my sources on the campaign have told me that one of the things they are doing is using the infrastructure that they have and the donation data that they have that identifies people's employers to actually put workers at some of these big employers in touch with each other so that they can actually do labor organizing at like Walmart, Amazon, CVS, Whole Foods. That's very cool. um, And connected them with other organizing that's going on. So that, yeah, I think that that's one of the things that builds off of the really smart labor organizing that we saw in places like California, but also in Iowa, um, that was identifying workers by industry. Um, And I like, this is the thing that I liked the best about the campaign this time around, because I think it was really smart in terms of like, understanding the recomposition of the working class, which is my number one obsession, y'all know me, but like <laughs> it it's it's a understanding that like the working class is not just like white dudes in, you know, Ohio, Michigan and Indiana, but the working class is like black and latino workers in Chicago and in, you know, the cities in Iowa and also like the workers who are in those factories um who are largely migrants in Iowa, right? That the ho- was the hog farm, it was the hog farm, right? It was a it was or a slaughterhouse, slaughtering I think. plant. Yeah. Processing plant. Great. That I know at least one listener of the dig uh, who may be listening right now worked on. A Dom, get it yes. get it you think shout uh, out. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Right. So this this kind of deep organizing in like specific immigrant communities that builds on like the work that organizations like the Awud Center in Minneapolis that has had such success with the Amazon workers, East African immigrant Amazon workers who first got Amazon to the bargaining table because they were being denied their prayer time. 
so this kind of like understanding of like where people work, how people work, what are their needs that aren't just like bread and butter, but are all sorts of different cultural, emotional, in this moment, healthcare, all of that. So I think that that's really interesting. The other thing I would caution against is like, Bernie is not our daddy and we're not going to be able to look to him to right. lead everything. Um, and so I say that having given all the compliments to the campaign that I just did and, you know, hoping that there's some sort of miracle and Joe Biden loses all these next primaries, including the one at Wisconsin that's about to go off in person and kill people. Wow. Um, wow. But I wow. think we really, really need to stop thinking that the solution in this moment is just to Bernie harder. Yeah, no, I think I do think the Bernie part, though, in terms of, you know, actual organizational infrastructure and who has it and who does it right now is is an important question or idea that we should be thinking of. Um, I, I really do, from what I understand, and maybe I'm, you know, being too biased here from uh, my understanding is that like Bernie was the campaign was the only one really doing dialers that were calling elected officials during the stimulus fight and that coupled with Bernie's speech was the thing that really like pushed the thing over and like having like about a million people call into different elected officials, which I, you know, but I, I do think it's a good question of like, Hey, um, you know, cause obviously I've been getting my texts from them and, you know, in terms of supporting workers and things like that, but like, you know, having that, it, you know, having that infrastructure then pointed at like state and local issues and the next the next stimulus that's to come. I think that would be helpful in terms of the work that we do, unless, you know, magically labor and other groups come together and start doing that kind of work themselves, which I don't see doing. Um, you know, and I'm and I'm all for like other like organizations filling that space. And I'm and I think for sure DSA can do that. Um I think we're still more on a little bit of a mutual aid footing right now. And I think we're shifting to how do we go, you know, go after the state and hold elected officials accountable. But I still feel like that if you say you're a social movement campaign, which is what the Sanders campaigns, you know, said it was and in, 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 in relation to all the other campaigns, then I think in a time like this, then um, which which I feel like Sanders has been doing, and it takes a while for like campaigns to do it, so that's that's fine too. You know, you do need to move to a social movement footing to respond to this crisis, and and in many ways, you know, for, at least for myself, I don't see stimulus for going different, and like the government's response to it to, at the federal level, especially going different, unless we have something at this unless we have an organization capacity at the scale of San uh, as, as the Sanders campaign and this is me talking in terms of the campaign itself not the deifying of Sanders you know per se yeah yeah uh, go ahead yeah I think the question of how we turn the campaign and like so our revolution is a thing that exists more or less right but like in this moment kind of less and the question of like, you know, and this is, I'm, I'm sorry, like, I, I, you know, I, I would like it to be more. Tell no lies, claim no easy victories. Like, we got to be real honest with ourselves about what we have and what we don't have right now and what needs to be stronger. And there's a way that like some of this infrastructure that the that campaign 2020, which is a massive improvement yes, over campaign 2016, yes, as it should have yes, been, yes, right? Yes, is, yeah. um, can we roll some of the structures from campaign 2020 into a container that already exists, right? That our revolution does exist. And there are at least some active groups. Sometimes they're overlapping with the ASA chapters. Sometimes they're they're In Massachusetts, distinct. they're pretty strong, um, but not... Yeah. So, right. So how do we, how do you roll over this infrastructure into something? Because like every presidential campaign in my freaking lifetime, I think, other than the Green Party ones, um, have left behind basically an email list, right? Um, and and they are organizations that, that exist. Like, look, like, like an email list is an incredibly powerful thing to have. It is, uh, yeah. Um, and they've yeah, done some yeah. good. The existence of Move On and Democracy for America and all of those things, they're not like bad. I'm not trying to say that they suck. What I'm trying to say is that they have limitations and they're not sufficient to the task. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. Yeah. so every single campaign has sort of left these things behind. And like, remember... I'm so old. I remember organizing for America, the thing that came out of Obama. Oh my god! Oh my god! And how, like, and everybody sort of says like they just demobilized it, and I was like, they didn't just they demobilize euthanized it, it though. Like they tried to mobilize yeah, they it in bad. It. No, they didn't even just euthanize what it. What they do? This is more important. So I talked to a lot of people, particularly from South Carolina, right? Because South Carolina, so I had happened to profile um, Anton Gunn, who was both a, a guy who briefly took a Republican state legislature seat off of a white tea partier he was a a uh, former 
football player and anyway and he was also the head of of organizing for america in the state of south carolina and so like they had a thing they had an infrastructure they did have it during the health care fight do you know what they wanted them what? to do call oh, republicans oh, gross. <laughs> gross. what yeah. is the point of calling <laughs> republicans because they're Democrats, right? and that's how they think. So it's like, it's not, it's not useful to just say, like, they demobilized them. What they did was they were strategically stupid in terms of how they tried to mobilize them. And then that effectively demobilized people because they were like, we are being told to do a thing that is dumb. I remember talking to a woman from California, same thing. They were like, they wouldn't let us pressure these waiver. Remember Bart Stupak? Yeah, the, the abortion, uh, Michigan, right? anti-choice yeah. Democrat. The way that that, right, that they were going to. Exactly. So Bart Stupak and his buddies were going to hold up the whole damn health care bill because they didn't want federal money to pay for abortions. abortions. Yeah. yeah. And OFA was not allowed to pressure wavering Democrats. Which so is like, pointless then. Yeah, when I'm yeah, talking about yeah. these things, like I'm, I'm not talking about them because I'm just like, ooh, shots fired. I'm like, because I've spent the last decade plus looking at how they work. And I want us to be really, really real about this because, like, people are dying right now. We have a healthcare system that does not work. I'm talking to nurses every day who are wearing garbage bags instead of hospital gowns. Like, this is deadly, deadly serious. And we have 10 million unemployed people in this country now. And so, like, everything I say is because I want every single one of these organizations to be better. Well, in terms of what organizations might play what role beyond the Sanders campaign. I, I want to read another quote from the Engler article. He writes, quote, a social movement response to major trigger events often emerges from unexpected places. Major structure based organizations have infrastructure and resources that seem like they would make them natural candidates for rallying the wider public into a response. However, they also face institutional limitations that prevent them from scaling their efforts to meet the enormity of the challenge. Groups like labor unions are commonly preoccupied with responding to how the crisis is affecting their own membership, dot, dot, dot. Meanwhile, politicians and leading advocacy organizations are often focused on the details of the inside game, carefully monitoring and attempting to use insider leverage to influence the policies that are being debated at the local, state, and federal levels. This is an important role, but it does not address the vacuum that exists in terms of mobilizing large numbers of people to change what are perceived as a needed and possible solutions to the crisis. Therefore, it is often scrappy, decentralized, and sometimes ad hoc groups that play vital roles in shaping a social movement response, which more institutionalized organizations can get behind once underway. What about this argument that that Engler is making in terms of the roles that more institutionalized groups might play and should play versus what newer organizations and formations might do? What do you think and what do you think the last, I don't know, like decade odd years of U.S. left history says about the answer to that? So I think what he's pulling from Obviously, is I mean his his own analysis, which is always trying to figure out like the relationship between structured based organizing versus like kind of sp spontaneous you know movement based organizing. So you know what what would be considered Occupy or Black Lives Matter movement, and even some of like the more formalized like we're gonna make a spontaneous moment organizations like Sunrise and stuff like that. So I mean I think for his analysis it's 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 spot on. I don't I, I like his analysis. I trend more towards a both and. I think, you know, I think labor, I think formal institutions have the ability to be moved and use use and will respond to this crisis. I think we have a different labor movement that's far more militant, you know, I think. And maybe I'm biased because I'm just thinking through like, you know, what, what LA union work is doing and like what bargaining for a common good type union work is doing and like what CTU and SEIU Local 73 is doing here locally. So I, I take that it is more biased, but... I think because we have a more militant labor movement that we will see more militant sets of actions happening. But that's not to discount that we still need informal or spontaneous organizing. Um, and I also don't, I think DSA does, you know, matter in its context and that we do have, you know, we do have an organization of like 60,000 members, you know, about probably like 30,000 active that actually can be mobilized, that is organizing right now and that will build out something. So 
I, I always take like the spontaneous thing versus the structure based or more institutional thing as kind of like a certain reading of history versus like actually what happens in times of organizing, you know, like our, our goal and what we should be and what I think we're trying to fight for is like, we have people who are elected officials that are actually socialist and radical. We have people at the labor level who represent that ide- those ideological commitments and strategic commitments in terms of militancy. But then, and that those groups of people then will support the spontaneous work that happens on the ground. But we also... I think we shouldn't necessarily look towards spontaneous things to happen, even the things that we usually interpret as spontaneous, like let's say some of the the Amazon work, um, some of the strikes going on is actually like networks that, you know, like what Sarah was talking about in terms of connections to Bernie or connections to Athena or connections to other types of organizing that's happening that might not be formal big labor, but is still you know, occurring. And so, yeah. Yeah. In terms of, uh, in terms of the, the both and, which I think is, is important. Like ideally we would want something if we do see a protest upsurge, God willing, like, like what we saw with Occupy to, to have that kind of mass energy take place at a moment when we have organiz- institutions like DSA, that would be, that would be good to have both at once and unions. So I think, I think it's important to like, when we think about institutions um, as sort of containers for organizing and energy, is that some of those things don't need to last. Like we don't, everybody doesn't need to be the member, a member of a socialist organization in order for things to have lasting impact. When you think about the Great Depression, right, you had a, a militant existing communist party in this country that was doing really amazing, important organizing and only, I don't know, ever had like, I don't know, I, I, can't pull numbers off the top of my head. I, I want to say like a hundred thousand members. Um, yeah, that's being more, generous. Yeah. Whatever we can fact yeah. check that, yeah. but like, yeah. right, like it was not that big, but it had an outsized impact because it could provide leadership and provide things that then could be. You know, I really can't say like things went viral. I know, because I know. Of stupid virus is reminding us like where that comes from. But like one of the things that I wrote about about Occupy was that it it replicated virally, right? It did sort of grow by people seeing it on the internet and going, oh, we could do that. And so like you don't need everybody to like become a member of Sunrise or to become a member of whatever in order to have an impact and to take part in things. And like, you know, as we were talking about the Bernie campaign, like – however many million people have voted for Bernie so far and given him money are not all becoming members of DSA. And I don't know if anybody's got updated numbers on membership. They didn't answer my last email asking that question. Ooh, so I don't know what they are. Ooh. But like, um, I'm just saying both of you are actually in DSA. So you might know more than I do on that front. I'm happy. I thought, I thought it was 30,000 active, like about 60,000 paper on paper like on paper. Yeah. 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 So that's about, that's, more or less where it's been for the last couple of years, right? Yeah, it's a yeah, little bit yeah, more yeah, yeah. In the last Encyclopedia Britannica like 000, says that the so. CPUSA's peak in 42 was 85,000 members, but that's more than I thought. Yeah, right. Yeah. So less than 100,000 members. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so like those organizations without sort of succumbing to like sort of secretive vanguardism can be really important in terms of putting demands out there back to questions of political platform. And also just in terms of like tactics that then right now we have it a lot easier than the CP did during the Great Depression in that we have the internet. And so it's really easy for people to see again, like these, these, you know, sort of honking protests where people are surrounding like an ICE detention center or a prison and just honking you can replicate that really easily, right? It's it's just what I just described. You can go do that in your own town tomorrow. And that kind of thing, we don't I, I wanna say that both like organizations and structures are are good and it's good to have them. And also that like existing outside of them is really important because like labor unions have money, they have pension funds, they have sometimes buildings, they can be sued under the Trump administration, they will be sued. The Trump administration would love nothing more than to dismantle unions for doing things that violate Taft-Hartley. These are things that like in the, the context that we exist in, they do have to be careful about that. There are some things that I'm willing to beat unions up on for being insufficiently militant that there's a lot of it. And I say that a lot. Um, nobody's surprised when I say those things. But there are other concerns that are like genuinely real and that are best done 
outside of the existence of an organization. Even DSA, which has an on paper existence, has dues, has a the 501c3 structure, you know, there are moments when you should do things not as DSA. And I imagine that a lot of DSA members who are listening to this have dealt with that question. So, you know, there's there's a lot going on here in terms of when we're thinking about organizations and institution and external capacity and the building of things to take leadership roles in this moment that, you know, we're, we're going to need like a whole bunch of different types of things, as, as Jason was saying. And I want us to, to be aware of like some of these things are going to, you know, they're not going to last. They're not going to be things that, that stick around forever. And that's fine. We'll need things in different shapes for during like when we're all on lockdown than the shapes that they will take when we can actually go out in public again. Also, the thing that's real interesting right now, thinking about tactics that just popped into my head is masks. Yeah. So in places like New York, there are like anti-mask laws for protests. And now, like I think it was Texas that I saw today that people can be fined for going out in public without a mask on. And like, ooh, that provides some interesting opportunities now, doesn't it? It's taking it further. I think there's like, you know, there's workers who are still being forced to work and they're not allowed to wear masks. And then I think just like when... I mean, there's this whole issue around masks, too, where it's like a bunch of universities have have masks and are not using it with their empty like research departments, like, you know, bio research departments. But just like tactics that are like about giving, you know, giving people, especially workers, um, you know, essential workers, the masks that they need in defiance of what their employer is saying and like, you know, supporting stuff like that. I'm Aziz Rana and you're listening to The Dig, a great place for analysis about where we are, how we got here and what can be done. It's my favorite podcast, and you can support it at patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by Haymarket Books, which has loads of great titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like, particularly at this moment, is No Is Not Enough, Resisting Trump's Shock Politics and Winning the World We Need by Naomi Klein. Acclaimed journalist, activist, best-selling author, and frequent dig guest, Naomi Klein has spent two decades studying political shocks, climate change, and brand bullies. From this unique perspective, she argues that Trump is not an aberration, but a logical extension of the worst, most dangerous trends of the past half-century the very conditions that have unleashed a rising tide of white nationalism the world over. It is not enough, she tells us, to merely resist, to say no. Our historical moment demands more, a credible and inspiring yes, a roadmap to reclaiming the populist ground from those who want to divide us, and that sets a bold course for winning the fair and caring world we want and need. This timely, urgent book offers a bracing positive shock of its own, helping us understand just how we got here and how we can, collectively, come together and heal. Klein is not preaching to the choir, but framing the moment, connecting necessary dots, and outlining the challenge that lies ahead in clear terms that anyone can understand. No is not enough by Naomi Klein, out now from Haymarket Books. I want to talk about some of the the specific issues that people have been organizing around, starting with, with housing, which we've touched on a little bit already. The crisis obviously has pushed it into the center, housing, to the center of public debate. And, and you've written about this at Descent, Sarah. Huge numbers of Americans already lived paycheck to paycheck and were spending a huge portion of those paychecks on rent. And now just an absolutely extraordinary number of people don't have paychecks. And so no money to pay rent. As you mentioned, we've seen homeless people taking over vacant homes in LA with reclaiming our homes. We're seeing talk of rent strikes all over the place. But what's much bigger than our actions right now are the objective conditions, which is the fact that a ton of people yeah. simply can't pay rent. To start, what sort of organizing are you seeing, are, are you two seeing taking place in terms of housing and rent strikes 
in various parts of the country. And and what sort of scale are they at and how might they be scaled up? I was thinking about that horrifying picture that a lot of your listeners have probably seen of the the um, parking lot, I guess, with like socially distanced squares drawn in for homeless people. No. And how just like uh, you haven't seen that. No. It's awful. I'll send it to you for like homeless people to like sleep in this like parking lot, but in these squares drawn on the thing. So they are not too close to each other. Um, And like these, this, this moment is making things visible in ways that weren't before, but also there are things like, you know, again, Gavin Newsom saying, we're just going to put homeless people in hotels and they're negotiating with hotels. And like, even in, in the UK, right. There was a headline that was just like, we've ended rough sleeping in London and people like, Oh word, you could do that. Um, yeah. Why didn't we do that before? And so it's, it's, <laughs> right, exactly. There's there's this moment of like, there's two things happening, right? One is that like, the demands are still not being met and people are in these conditions that were already objectively like inhuman and then they're getting worse. But then also there are people who are just like doing the thing in this way that like they've, you know, we've said forever, you can't do that. Like it turns out that the US government can just send everybody a $1,200 check. Cool. Now we know you can do that. You can end rough sleeping in London. Cool. We know you can do that now, right? Airbnb is a really interesting one. There was a viral series of tweets from some guy who literally just like looked at Zillow data um, about all these apartments that were suddenly appearing on as longer term rentals, which had been taken off and been in the short term rental market, otherwise known as Airbnb. And what that was showing about how much of the housing stock Airbnb is actually like taking out. And that is really fascinating. And, you know, I was thinking about that also because I was thinking about all these former Obama administration hacks who have taken all these jobs at these, you know, gig economy companies, these, you know, Silicon Valley, whatever the hell they want to call them, Um, like Jay Carney going on Twitter to like, you know, complain about Amazon workers and getting ratioed to hell. Um, I think, Dan, you were part of that, right? Um, (laughs) And uh, speaking of whatever, like I said, I support ratioing. I did announce on Twitter just last night that I'm adapting to quarantine by becoming a reply guy just as a hobby, not as my politics. The reply guys are (laughs) there is like there. I have made many jokes about like the reply guy energy of, of, you know, cooped up. Wait, what is the reply guy? energy? I don't know much about Twitter. Yeah, I didn't even know you were on Twitter until the other day. You're very low key on there. It's someone who uh, makes a lot of replies. (laughs) Yeah, they're basically like dudes that hang out, particularly in the mentions of like women, and just reply oh, to like gross. all of your tweets, whether gross. it's like a rhetorical question or whatever. But yeah, so anyway, ratioing Jay Car- Carney is fine. I want to stress it is just not really political activism. But like, so all of these Obama administration guys are working for like Airbnb and Uber and whatchamacallit and GoFundMe. That's one that really makes me mad. Those, those dudes from Pod Save America that also work for GoFundMe. <laughs> but this is this is a moment, right, to point out that like these companies, the, the harm that these companies are doing because it's becoming obvious in ways that it wasn't already because the virus both like has given people more, I mean, more spare time to be reply guys, but also more spare time to sort of pay attention to these things. And also because like the virus is not anyone's fault. Like when we, people say like the virus is democratic, it affects everybody equally. What they mean is it's no one's fault. Right. It's not your fault if you get coronavirus. It's just a thing that happened because you breathed in the wrong location at the wrong time. Right. And so in a moment where like it's no one's fault that they can get this, we can suddenly have more sympathy for like people who are on Rikers, who are in absolutely just atrocious, atrocious disease producing conditions on a daily basis, who are now in these conditions where this this virus is spreading um, I think Rikers is Rikers Island prison in New York is the the like densest center of the disease in the country. I wonder why. But you you could have more sympathy for these people in this moment because the virus is not anything that they did in a way that like even, you know, we, we know because we know the history and because Jason's already brought up ACT UP that like people blamed people who got AIDS for getting AIDS, right? Because it came about through specific behaviors. And therefore you could be like, well, you shouldn't have been having unprotected sex and you shouldn't have been using Or IV you shouldn't drugs. be you shouldn't be but gay. The virus just comes from breathing. One of the responses. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the virus just comes from breathing. And it's gonna have unequal impacts based on all sorts of intersecting inequalities that we can unpack forever. But like 
it's harder to, to sort of say that it's like your fault if you got sick with something like this. And that makes it easier to sort of make these points. I think it's way harder, maybe. I don't know if it's even way harder. It might be a little harder, but I think the right, I think, you know, we can trust the right wing and even, um, you know, like neoliberals to find a way to um, blame poor people, blame blame immigrants, blame working class people. For, I mean, they're going to try, certainly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think, and so I think that's always my, I think this this pandemic has the uh, has the ability to be like a great equalizer, but I think it's it's only based upon like us organizing around these conditions and politicizing like what the what the consequences of those uh, of the pandemic is uh, it has been and that it it didn't need to be like this you know like another world was did this pandemic could have been handled in a different way if we lived in a different society particularly like a democratic socialist society with Medicare for all, fair wages, sick leave and all that. Because I, I, I do feel that, um, you know, even for someone like my mom, I think, you know, who's a fairly, you know, just, you know, middle of the road, Obama Democrat kind of person, right? Sometimes veers a little bit more, more left, feels bad for the people in prison, right? But then still feels that like, well, we can't release them now because of A, B and C or so. And I, I, I do feel like well, while people can have have sympathy, I don't think that, enters into a place of like class solidarity and a place of like we need to free these people because it's um you know because it's the right thing to do we still need like political action to actually make that happen and and people will still feel that they're undeserving in many ways you know yeah i want to i want to be real clear that i do not in any way think this virus is the great equalizer in fact it is the opposite and if you just look at the map of new york city when where the virus is most dense you can see that immediately yeah yeah um, yeah but that like so friends of mine in the uk um at the think tank autonomy did a breakdown of who is most vulnerable to the disease. They did not break it out by race, but they did break it out by gender. And surprise, surprise, 77% of the people who are most likely to be exposed to the coronavirus at work are women in low-wage industries. So, like, this is the least equal possible thing that could happen, right? But what I'm saying is that you, we have an opportunity. I'm not saying any of this stuff is magically going to happen because it's not. But like, we have an opportunity to say that these things that existed and that were already screwing up everything, this crisis makes it much more obvious the ways that they have been doing that. And that in a way that you can then also say like, hey – there are no bad guys in terms of who, how people got the virus, but there are definitely people who are exploiting it. There are definitely people who have created the conditions that allowed it to spread by creating homelessness, by creating tent cities on, you know, under every overpass in California, by creating all of these inequalities that are being exacerbated every day by how this virus is spreading. And as I was just discussing with Amy Kapczynski and Greg Gonzalez, this is like one of those moments that really elucidates the power of the left over liberal critique. It's not just that our systems of of oppression and exploitation exceptionally harm particular groups, but that that per, that exceptional harm meted out and vulnerability meted out to particular groups facilitates creating a society that makes the vast majority more vulnerable as well. Um, okay, I want to go back to housing. Are we going to see actual rent strikes or just people not paying rent? Because huge numbers of people just can't pay it. And that's a powerful economic reality that will have powerful social, political, economic consequences that are hard to even imagine right now. But it's also not the same thing as a purposefully organized rent strike. After all, even Comrade Cheesecake Factory is refusing to pay rent. <laughs> Comrade Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> um, it'll finally be the moment where the merchant class and the working class work together to defeat our capitalist overlords. Okay. Um, no. Um, oh, yes. But no, I, I mean, I think it's a possible, you know, I, I was on a call, uh, National People's Action is having this like rent zero campaign and they had a call for it with, with Acre, with Action Center on Racing the Economy. And, you know, they're telling like this really interesting story of like when they're first doing tenant organizing around the, the virus. Um, and well, I think it was like it preceded it. And they're talking about how and when they would talk to people, like do their one on ones and just, you know, get a lay of, get a lay of like the building tenement. 
what they realized was that like people were already planning on withholding their rent. Um, people were already like in and had already like notified their landlords. But the thing was, is just like it hadn't had a chance to become public and to become politicized, you know, and like in terms of like being actually oppositional to the landlord and then putting out a set of demands collectively. And so I think that's going to be and that's going to be like our constant challenge is that people on their own the suffering, the oppression, exploitation is going to get individualized and it's on us to like politicize and collectivize it. And it's going to just, it's just going to be harder now. I mean, it's already really hard work to, to organize and to do tenant organizing, but it's just going to be, I think it's going to be harder to have that in-person contact. So then it's going to have to happen through phones. It's going to happen, happen through social distancing, but I still think it's going to happen. I think, you know, like autonomous, autonomous tenants union in Chicago. Um, there's an also another tenants union here on the South side. You know, they're already feeling the pressure and I feel like elected officials are feeling the pressure to do something. I know this might be an easy cop out, but I think it's going to be both end where it's, there's, there's going to be some tenant strikes, um, like rent strikes. And then also in response or in conjunction, just canceling rent for everyone from elected officials because they know that this is, you know, a reality. But I would also argue, I don't think we can get to kind of massive rent cancellations, you know, from the government and forcing developers to do so unless we have concerted actions around, um, you know, rent strikes in that way. And so to clarify on that, and and either of you can answer this, the rent strikes demand, the, the rent strike has to have demands. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes. Yes, beyond just cancel rent for our building. But also, like, I do think, and we said this in, in the email conversation we had leading up to this, I think, that, like, there is something powerful about having, like, rent strike in the sort of collective consciousness while people are then unable to pay their rent. One, because like, then it, you know, it can look more purposeful than it is, which is great. You can, we can look like we have more people on rent strike than we do, which is great. I, I, I'm, I mean, we're laughing, but it's also no, true, no, right? it's totally true. Like, so I talked to a guy the other day who works at a Domino's pizza in West Virginia, and he was already going to call in sick to work and say, I'm not coming in and working in these conditions because he's got a kid who has respiratory problems and he did not want to risk bringing something home to his child, right? So he was already going to call off and refuse to work. And then he saw General Strike trending on Twitter. And that gave him, even though he's still the only one at his workplace who was doing that thing, he that gave him something to feel like he was connected to when he called in and said, yeah, I guess I inadvertently joined the general strike. Right? And a like, framework to rearticulate like, his own individual exactly, situation. Exactly. Exactly. And so what happens, you know, talking about the lack of fault that I was saying before, the other thing that happens is like you need – people to be mad and think that they can actually make change in order for people to get involved in organizing, right? They need to not just feel like it's their own fault, whether we're talking about labor, whether we're talking about debt, whether we're talking about rent. People need to feel like the thing that is wrong is not their own individual personal fault. So it's not their fault they can't pay rent because they can't go to work because coronavirus, because Donald Trump said stay home, right? So that is not their fault. And then when you have rent strike trending or your neighbor down the block has a big sheet hanging out their window with rent strike on it, then you see like, oh, there's something we can do. And those two things, like I always say, like, I'm not, I don't think that like journalism changes the world. I don't think that like reading is something that I wrote changes the world. But what it can do and why I write about the things I write about is it can show people that somebody else has the same problem that they do. And this is what they did to fight it. Jason? Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, I think the reality is is that people are already not paying their rent, and it's and it's just it's figuring out, you know, how do you organize around it? Like, how do you more organize around it at scale? You know, like how do you get to like a point where it's like, you know, how do we measure out like what's the fifty percent, sixty percent of this area, that area of people who are who are rent striking? And I'm sure you won't need any when you're those kind of numbers in order to have an impact. Um, but people are doing that, and I think they will keep on doing it. And I mean, because of, you know, the fact that it is harder to like have a scapegoat in this thing of like personal failings and things like that. Let's talk about la labor. Workers who were already organizing at Trader Joe's are making a big push right now for hazard pay and management is grotesquely but unsurprisingly running a textbook anti-union campaign. We, of course, saw Amazon workers in Staten Island and also outside Detroit and Instacart delivery workers nationwide walk off the job this week. But it seems like it wasn't 
that many workers. And, and this is absolutely no knock on the worker organizers, but the walkouts don't seem to have been anywhere big enough to have economically impacted either company, though they did, I think, and this is no small thing, generate a ton of of media attention. What do you both make of the situation? Because these are some of the hardest workplaces to organize under, quote unquote, normal circumstances. And as liberals like to say, you know, this is not normal. Um, but oh my God. <laughs> I, I finally, oh God, I finally why agree, did you do I that, finally agree oh with them. God. I finally agree with them. Why did you do that? Okay, fine. Why did you do that? (laughs) Um, That's not cool, man. But so, okay, so first things first is the Instacart workers won. Reuters today headline was Instacart workers to get safety kits after strike. Reuters, that's not Jacobin, that's not Dissent, that's not me, that's not you, that's Reuters saying that. They won. So, like, round of applause for the Instacart workers because even if it wasn't that many of them, they got a lot of press. Hell yeah. The other thing to do again with these platforms and with these things is you sort of claim more than you necessarily have. But, you know, I saw everybody was sharing on Instagram these these things of like, you know, don't order from Instacart today because they're on strike. Right. So, you know, these kinds of things that spread again, I hate to use the word virally now because it just feels terrible, but they do. You can again, you can sort of punch above your weight class in right, that way. Right. Um, and this goes back to like, well, the fight for 15 and also our Walmart, which is now United for Respect, they only ever had like a handful of workers striking at Walmart. And they scared Walmart so much. Walmart closed some stores, gave them a raise, gave them, (laughs) um, what was it, um, different, like changed their maternity um, situation. And now Walmart's given them sick pay during the crisis, right? So like you can, because these massive companies are really vulnerable to bad PR, you can punch above your weight class. Like again, why is Jay Carney on Twitter defending Amazon? from Christian Smalls, right? From this one specific worker that they've decided to scapegoat, right? And why is Amazon um, boosting its hourly pay $2? Right, exactly. Like these companies know that they look like assholes in this moment. And the reason that they hired all those Obama administration hacks is to make them look good and progressive and to make people like, you know, well, not like us because we're, you know, unrepentant communists, but like other people who voted for Obama to feel good about like Airbnb is great and, you know, Uber is wonderful because David Pluff works there and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Amazon is lovely because it hires Jay Carney to, to massage its image. So, you know, I think that that's really, really important. That said, we need more. Also, each one of these strikes generates, again, press that then generates more interest in going on strike that reminds people that strikes can win. So, you know, it is it is all, as we said at the beginning, not nearly enough, but it's a hell of a lot more than we used to have. And it's working. Right on. Jason. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I mean, it's working. And I think I mean, at least to me, you know, I think it's an opportunity that it can be like a tip of the iceberg. Like I, I, you know, we're actually fairly early in the crisis of like of Corona. And I think the longer this the longer this goes on under these conditions, I think we're going to see more. And I think we're going to have you know, and I think we'll, we'll be able to see like workers having more time to actually, you know, organize at at a deeper scale, at a larger scale. Yeah. So that's I mean, I think. I mean, I think if anything, I, I'm a little bit surprised it happened as quick as it did. And, you know, I think it's to Sarah's point is that like you have huge amount of leverage as workers and as people who like support those you know, support essential workers in terms of getting the wins that we want in order for us to like survive this this crisis. Um, yeah, we've also seen unionized workers taking action. And uh, I'm going to name a few examples here and please add to them. Detroit bus drivers went on strike and won the elimination of bus fares for the duration of the yes. crisis. Yes. Talk about bargaining for the common good right there. Yeah. That was amazing. Sanitation workers represented by the Raleigh City Workers Union are demanding, I don't know where this struggle is at right now, but Mindy was writing about it in these times recently, demanding testing, protective equipment, hazard pay. NNU, the National Nurses Union, which amongst other nurses represents 10,000 nurses at 19 hospitals run by um, 100,000 nurses. Oh, out of a yeah, so so 10 of their 100,000 nurses are at these 19 hospitals uh owned by HCA Healthcare and they're demanding protective equipment and it, yeah, and as Jason just said this is these are early days but but how how do you two see unions and the workers they represent, workers who are already organized? How do you see them responding to the crisis? 
how does that compare to what we've seen and what we were just discussing around non-unionized workers? And and lastly, how might these crisis-specific campaigns play into longer-term struggles and the longer-term balance of power between workers and, and their bosses? So I'm going to shout out a couple more in addition to that. Um, the flight attendants union, Sarah Nelson, everybody's favorite labor leader these days, um, and their power of, well, I mean, now they're having to fight for it because the Trump administration wants to immediately undermine the protections in what was passed. But they won really strong worker protections for the aviation industry in the bailout bill. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other one that I'm really obsessed with right now, and I'm chasing talking to some of the workers. So if any of y'all are listening, get at me, um, is the workers at GE who are demanding to use idled or shuttered plants to build ventilators. And these are CWA so industrial division this is, represented. Yeah, it's IUE, CWA. Yep. And they have already had one action in Lynn, Massachusetts, and they may or may not have had more by the time you hear this podcast. Um, but this is a really particularly close to my heart sort of demand because it goes back to a history of when the labor movement used to say, argue that production workers should have a say over what they produced, not just the pay that they received for producing it. And so I wrote about this a little bit this year when, or um, last year, excuse me, in spring of 2019, um, when the Lordstown GM plant closed outside of um, Youngstown, Ohio, because the history of sort of demands around workers' control at that particular plant are really fascinating. The history of demands in Youngstown for the workers to be able to reopen things that were closed and make socially useful things um, in the UK. Around the shuttered steel mills. Mm -hmm, right around the steel mills. Um, the Democracy Collaborative, which is an organization that exists and does really great research, um, comes out of that movement in Youngstown. Um, and then there is... But Jimmy the, Carter the fucked them, just as a side note. But Jimmy Carter fucked them, yes. Um, never trust a Democrat? I don't know. Um, so um, in the UK, there was a thing called the Lucas Plan, which was um, Lucas Aerospace workers who demanded to be allowed to um, take over the plant and, again, build socially useful things. And this is really, really important when we talk about the other crisis that we're all going to you know, get killed by, which is climate change. So when we're talking about workers demanding to run plants that these companies are closing because they're no longer profitable or whatever their excuse is because they want to ship them somewhere where they can exploit workers in even worse conditions, these workers are now making demands that are, are making life-sustaining things, right? So instead of making bombs and cars and other things that are killing us slowly or quickly, they want to make ventilators to literally help people breathe. And that demand could be transferred into making solar panels or making any number of other things that we will need for a proper green transition. And so seeing that demand right now, like, gives me, like, all of the feelings, right? It's like an explosion of, of whatever, because, you know, right now what we need in the short term is a demand for everybody to be able to stay home. And that means the government needs to give us more money um, back to Bernie's, you know, $2,000 a month per person until this is over, which is great. If anything, it's too small. Um, but after that, we're going to need to, A, like get things going again, but also we're going to need to take climate change seriously. And one of the things that this moment has shown us is that we can. We can change things real quick. We can change an entire economy like that. We can do it. No more excuses. The only reason we're not doing it is because people don't want to. Yeah. And I, I'm planning on doing an entire another episode on how climate change and Green New Deal politics play into all of this. But that's a really important point that we're not going to be able to get into in anywhere enough detail today. And I also wanted to mention that in terms of demands that people stay at home as as a labor demand, um, an article from the Boston Globe I sent you earlier today, the sent you both earlier today that the the building trades union statewide, all of, all of the building trades unions, I believe in in Massachusetts, the entire council is calling for the shutdown, the go governor Baker, Massachusetts's Republican governor, because it's Massachusetts always fucking elects Republican governors, so for him to shut down non-essential construction sites um, because you can't be socially distant on a construction site. And so that's a that's another demand. Jason? Yeah, I mean, bargaining for the common good, you know, especially that Detroit story, I think is powerful. I, th I think we're going to 
all things are conditional, right? But I think we're going to see more militant labor action, especially from public sector unions. And I think especially when the reality starts coming in of the massive layoffs that um, state and local budgets are going to start to do because of like the lack of fiscal support that they're getting fi- uh, federally or from the Federal Reserve. And so I think that's going to be and it's coming soon. I mean, states are already doing that. And you know, I think public sector unions are going to be on the front line of preventing that from happening. And and I think making a pretty compelling argument that um, it'll be it'll be nice because most people don't want to kim- most people don't care about like what their city's bond rating is in relation to their debt and their and their pension <laughs> obligation. But I it's going to be I think it's going to be a really a possibly like a powerful moment to connect like. How, sit, how cities, how states finance themselves, how they finance public workers, and then showing like how essential like, you know, um, sets of public workers are and like why we must keep them on board. And if anything, like making demands about like an increase of public services instead of a decrease of that. Um, but that's also like only done within, you know, I don't want to romanticize labor. That's that's done within the context of, of of labor unions that want to bargain for the common good and not just have like this narrow conception of like, where where's my pension fund at? Where's this at and that at? And I'm just gonna get mine in the end. But I I think the I mean you know J W Mason just had an article on it. You know the coming kind of like fiscal apocalypse for local municipalities and states municipalities um, are is, is yeah is really going to like force labor their tax revenues just. Plummeting. Yeah, and there's no support. I mean, like you know, the 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 stimulus bill was like 850 billion for I mean, tr- uh, uh, 850 billion for the private sector and only 150 billion for the public sector in terms of like, in terms of like you know states and and, and local mun- municipalities. And then I think I think the those checks cost I think 200 billion in all, right? So I mean, there was just no support, and hopefully that you know all, all that changes is insider stuff, but. I think that's going to condition a lot of the labor organizing that you see going on uh, moving forward, especially in the pub in the public sector around hospitals and healthcare. Yeah, I think we should mention that everybody's favorite governor, um, because people for some weird reason think Andrew Cuomo is good now. Oh God, it's just disgusting. forced through he's doing all the cuts. Okay, he's doing the biggest cuts. Can we just like have a collective two minute yeah, hate of Andrew doing, Cuomo? He's doing the biggest collective cuts right now. I mean, it, for for a blue state, he person, just forced you know? through an austerity, and budget. he just rolled back bail reform like just now. Yeah. Yeah. In the budget, the budget, because that's a thing. And like, so yeah, Andrew Cuomo just cut Medicaid, which also, by the way, means that then that also screws with New York's ability to get some of the money that is allocated in this stupid stimulus bill. Not all of the stimulus bill is stupid, but a lot of it is. This is this is what he's doing now. This is what he's doing, like, in the middle of the crisis. And, you know, when people are like, oh, but he's doing a good job of leading in the crisis, like, I want everybody to be really, really, really 100% clear that he is doing that in order to fuck you. He is going out there and getting a really great reputation and shining it all up, not because the DNC is secretly plotting to switch him for Joe Biden, whatever. I mean, who knows what they'll do, but, like, that's not the thing I'm worried about. He is doing that so he can go in and get all of the Democrats who control now both houses of New York State Legislature— because he no longer has the independent Democratic caucus to blame for his refusal to do anything good. He is doing that so he can strong arm people into agreeing to his austerity budget that is going to kill people. You know, it's not, you know, Cuomo is just the beginning, right? That, um, and, and I think even people who are not as narcissistic or let's say self motivated like, you know, self-absorbed as, as Cuomo, you know, they, they will, no, I mean, they'll feel like, you know, I got to be a, I eat everyone except Donald Trump. Right, right. right. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's just the feeling of like, oh, I still have to be, you know, just like foolish ideas around balanced budget, and and for sure, states and and and, and local municipalities are, are are structured differently, have different constraints, but still, I think it, it's just going to be a lot of hard work to like really make sure people understand that, like, you know, if you do these cuts, we kill people, and I think you know, labor is going to be a strong part of making sure that doesn't happen, and like frontline workers are going to help make that happen, and then you know. Like the spontaneous organizing that we've already been seeing and continue seeing is going to be a, a strong part of saying like, no, we need government. No, we need like good government that actually supports us. Yeah, that brings there was a thing that I meant to mention way earlier and totally forgot about until now. So sorry, Dan. But um, the teachers in New York City who organized a mass sick out in order to force the schools closed because Bill de Blasio and Andrew Cuomo were happy to keep them open. So this was, and this again, going back to the question of like these organizing networks, 
that have been going for the last decade. Um, this was organized by Moore, which is the the equivalent in New York of the caucus that took over the Chicago Teachers Union, um, and they were inspired, of course, by Chicago. They have yet to take power within the union in New York for reasons of undemocratic union structure that I could talk about until the cows come home. But what they did do was manage to pull together calls, organizing calls, and get a bunch of people, once again, who are not necessarily members of Moore, but who were horrified by being forced to go to work in these conditions, to get involved and to say that they would call out sick too. And so you had 400 people on a Zoom call over the weekend, and then you had however many teachers who were, you know, filing for substitutes, basically, the way that you um, report your absence is to go into an electronic system and ask for a request a substitute. So this information was like coming in over the weekend. And on Sunday, finally, they announced that they were closing schools. So that's just like one more example of both bargaining for the common good and also the way that like smaller groups who have a clear, coherent political message can then pick up a lot of of ambient support in moments when things are changing really fast, when material conditions are, are different. We're seeing big pushes to get people out of prisons and jails and immigrant detention centers. And there have been some, if nowhere near big enough, but still substantial successes in reducing jail populations. And this is something that we're seeing both in response to movements and also from some more progressive left elected leadership. But at the same time, in New York, we see, as was just mentioned, Cuomo, resist, resistance, COVID resistance hero, governor of New York, r- rolling back bail reform amidst at, at this time of all times. And I just read a story in The Intercept this morning about the NYPD arresting people for not being socially distant, the punishment for not being socially distant being thrown into a, a holding cell with a bunch of other people. Um, by cops who probably have the damn virus because like a whole bunch of them have been tested yeah, and found a tested positive. Yeah, it's something like 16% of the NYPD was out the last time I checked on uh, sick. So uh, so we do see a big push that's having impact to, to reduce jail populations. I'm not um, so sure about how, how effective it's been so far with prisons, though I know there's a push, a lot of pushes there. And with immigrant detention centers, I'm not sure what the latest – is but I do know that there's a a lawsuit under the Flores agreement that seems like it has a good shot of getting a lot of children who are detained at least released. What do you make of these campaigns and how might their victories, short-term victories be made into more permanent ones once this moment of acute crisis passes whenever whenever that might be because obviously if we're in the situation where city A whatever city's jail has half the number of people in it after this crisis is over and the sky doesn't fall, you know, we should be fighting to keep it that way. So to me, you know, I, I do think the most promising organizing that has been that has been happening has been around the decarceration work. I mean, I know in Chicago, Chicago Community Bond has just been doing really great, like pressure campaigns in terms of calling in, writing, you know, to the state's attorney and to like the sheriff to release everyone in jails. And then that's also been connected to like Chicago Teachers Union, SEIU Local 73, United Working Families, you know, making demands in the same way so that it's not just like put to like decarceration organizations. And then I feel like, you know, after Reclaim Homes in LA, you know, the the best on the ground work has been car caravans around ICE detention uh, centers and then also like around um, jails and, you know, getting people to demand that, that people get released. And even the prison work, there is like strong work around like state state villas and prisons, at least in Illinois, to like have folks released and or to follow like social distance procedures. But I think, you know, the bigger work has been around releasing them all from even sectors of, I think, progressive groups and the left that you would watch what's what. what once seemed kind of like, you know, they wouldn't touch such a demand, you know, that, that they're now touching a demand and, and then mobilizing and doing action around it that's deemed necessary. Yeah, I think once again, we're sort of seeing at least some movement on this in a way that's like, oh, you could do that? Cool. Then you could always do that, right? Um, and then at the same time, as we just said with Andrew Cuomo, you see people trying to roll back gains that had been made through, again, through campaigns to elect more progressive elected officials and 
ground level organizing around decarceration in New York broadly. So, you know, it's this weird, weird time in terms of all of these demands, where as Jason was saying, like sometimes the people who are kind of on your side when it comes to some things still have these like, we can't let people out of jail because those people are scary. And that I think we have to do a very good job of connecting all of these demands and the coronavirus, like it does kind of do some of that work for us again to say like, what, what do we need in this moment, again, to sort of go back to those like five demands that I'm seeing over and over again, right? When you're saying you need to let people out of immigration detention, with which like most good liberals will kind of agree with, especially in the Trump era when you're not yelling at Obama for locking people up. Um, Dan wrote a book about that. <laughs> Buy my book. Um, <laughs> Buy Dan's book. But like, okay, so people can can get with you on like let immigrants out of detention. They have done nothing wrong. So then, okay, well, what are the con- conditions in immigration detention? How are those similar to the conditions in prison? There's also a weird thing that I'm thinking about right now in terms of just like all of us being kind of isolated. And, you know, people have been referring to this as being on house arrest, right? Yeah. And like- I'm lucky I live with two roommates who are lovely humans and they both cook, which is great because I don't. Um, So I'm not like completely alone. But for the last year in New York City, I was living in a sublet by myself in a building full of older people, in fact, which would have been a whole other set of things because I would have probably wanted to get out of there just so I wasn't a, you know, vector of disease for, you know, people who are much more vulnerable to it than I am. But like I think about how already this is is emotionally very difficult for me just being unable to like go down the street and hug my friend who lives three blocks away right Mm -hmm. um and so people are weirdly getting a taste of what prison is like in a much softer much easier way than anybody who's in jail or prison is experiencing but you can say to people now like do you know how hard it is for you right now imagine that that's your life Right. We're three weeks in and you're still sleeping in your own bed and you still maybe have your husband or your roommate or your neighbor down the block to wave to at and least your and you can go walk your dog. With a pantry, right. You with can food cook your it. own food. You can make a phone call whenever you want. You have Skype. Imagine being on lockdown without any of those things that are making your life bearable right now. Like I think that is again like a really amazing opportunity to like invite people into empathy. Yes. In this moment. And I think that that's what all good organizing and all good journalism both do. Yeah. And just, you know, but, and just to like, you know, we're nowhere, there's not enough organizing and we're not doing nearly enough to like stop the arresting of people, right? People are still being arrested. Police are still sticking their chest out being like, we need to arrest, we need to arrest people and that you need law enforcement in order to like enforce shelter and orders. And, um, and there's even like arrests around, you know, people getting arrested for trans like transmission of corona so um i mean i think it's just like there's work that we still need to do in terms of making sure like our elected officials know that you know we should not have like carousel responses to like any sort of shelter in orders and that also that like police just need to i mean like i think philly is probably like the closest to like having really strict orders like from like combining the mayor state's attorney like all the different all the different like like factions of law enforcement of saying like don't we call them da outside of uh illinois oh that's so interesting okay (laughs) yes this is true this is true um but like you know but we need to like be making sure that like that's really clear that like that 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 kind of work is happening or else there's just going to be more people fed into like jails um at, at like at a time when it shouldn't happen um and also people you know elected officials and the right wing using this as an opportunity to jail more people and to say that we do need police and policing more than ever. Right. And I think there's also a really interesting point to be made in terms of like, who are the heroes of this crisis? They aren't cops. The cops are going to try to say that they are, but they're not, right? Like, I'm, but the thin again, blue I was line. driving through Philly today. <laughs> but, you know, but like, but like cops and firefighters were sort of the heroes of 9 11, right? <laughs> that that was like everybody lionized them right, right, after right. that. But right now, they are not doing anything useful. Firefighters are still fighting fires, which is very useful. But And they're cross-trained you know, the as police, CMTs. Right. But what are the police doing? They're walking around the neighborhood, making sure you don't breathe on somebody. And But we have, like, these billboards in the city that are saying, like, thank you to first to essential employees. And they say, like, grocery store workers on them. 
And again, I think that's an amazing opportunity that like people are being invited to understand. I did an interview with somebody earlier today who was saying that like grocery store workers are being classified in some cases as first responders. What does that do to our imagination of these things? They're the actual thin blue line. They're the actual line between society and chaos. (laughs) And so how do we, right? So how do we, we use this moment where our idea of who's a hero is, is rapidly changing to like the pharmacist who talks to you while you get your prescription rather than the cop? How do we keep that? How do we like expand that? How do we think about that? And how do we use it to say like, actually, you know, in this crisis, like what did the cops do? They arrested people for breathing on each other. What the hell? Well, on that very apropos note, Sarah Jaffe (laughs) and Jason Perez, thank you both very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Jason Perez is a senior research analyst at ACRE, or the Action Center on Race and the Economy, who studies the connections between police violence, mass incarceration, and economic justice. Sarah Jaffe is a reporting fellow at the Tight Media Center, the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and the forthcoming book, Work Won't Love You Back. Thank you for listening to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that people make history, but not under conditions of their own choosing, while other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis, music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinators are Julia Rock and Zachary Nin. Our senior advisor is Thea Riofrancos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please do find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe to this podcast. If it's on iTunes or wherever it might be, please leave us a nice review. Those reviews ostensibly introduce us to new listeners. But what really and truly does that is you just telling people you know, or strangers, whatever, telling people about the show and why you like it. Please make propaganda for us. And do, last but not least, find us at patreon.com slash the dig and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. 